This was the third study that Dr. Alan Redpath gave from the life of David. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you. Nice to see you again this morning. Good to have these messages in song that help us to prepare our hearts for the Word of God. Turn with me, please, will you, to Second Samuel chapter 5. Second Samuel chapter 5. Reading from verse 4, Second Samuel 5, 4. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned thirty and three years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither. Thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up <coughs> to the gutter <coughs> and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore, they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, and cedar trees, and carpenters, and masons, and they built David an house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. Verse 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. And David heard of it, and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephan. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to baal Perazim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon thine enemies before me as a breach of water. Therefore he called the name of that place baal Perazim. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again, El Perazim. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again, and spread themselves in the valley of Rephan. And when David inquired of the Lord, <clears throat> he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come upon them over against the mulberry tree, and let it be. When thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry tree, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so, as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gaza. <clears throat> Let's look to God in prayer a moment. <clears throat> Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Speak just now. Some message to meet my need, which thou only dost know. Speak now through thy holy word, and make me see some wonderful truth thou hast to show to me. For Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> There's much on my heart that I would feel God would have me say to you this morning from this passage of Scripture. I'll need to speak in shorthand to get through. Hope you can follow. Excuse me if we go a little quicker, accelerate the pace, because the time is somewhat limited. <clears throat> we have moved on now in our studies in the life and character of David to a most strategic moment. He is now king over all Israel and Judah. And for the first time in the history of God's people, they are entering into the possession of all that God intended they should have in the land. And David is now undisputed king. 
And immediately David is crowned king over all Israel, things begin to happen. And things happened to David at that time which are exactly the same as the very things that happen in your life when Jesus has a coronation day in your heart. And we're going to look at these things this morning. In the course of the ministry of this week, as I prayed about it, knowing that I was following hard on the heels of a dynamic preacher last November, my very beloved friend Stephen Alford, I knew that he'd have precipitated a crisis anywhere. And I was quite sure that the crisis of the sovereignty of Jesus Christ had been hammered home to you in the power of the Spirit of God as few other preachers can. And I have been concerned in this ministry not so much to emphasize or present the Christ, but to present to you the life that has to be lived following the Christ. And I'm assuming this evening that in some measure at least you understand that the basic of experience of Christianity is the new sovereignty of the Lord Jesus in one's life. But what happens after maintaining that life, the secret of going on with the Lord? And inevitably, when Jesus has a coronation day, what a wonderful day, things begin to happen. And we're going to look at some of the things this morning that happened today, that immediately he was crowned king. Because these are just a simple picture of the very things that happen in your life and mine on that great day. In the first place, if you will notice with me then in this chapter, the sovereignty of David was immediately confirmed. There were unmistakable evidences, both outward and inward evidences in David's life, that God was with him and that he was a man possessed of unusual authority and unusual power. In the first place, you notice from this chapter that an enemy who had been deeply entrenched in that land for many, many years was ejected without notice, was given notice to quit and had to go. I'm sure you recall from your study of the Old Testament that from the very beginning of the occupation of the land by the people of God, Jerusalem had been a thorn in the flesh. They had never been able to eject the citizens of that city. In the 15th chapter of Joshua, in the 63rd verse, we are told that Judah could not drive out the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And though for a little while, as you would find in the first book of first chapter of Judges and the 8th verse, for a little while they seemed to have succeeded, it wasn't long afterwards before the inhabitants were back again. And... Uh, in the 21st verse of the, eighth chapter of the first chapter of Judges, you find again that the Benjaminites had settled down to exist in Jerusalem with the Jebusites. They were unable to cast them out. But now David is king, and it would be quite impossible for David to rule from that city with the inhabitants of the land living in peaceful coexistence. This would be an impossible situation. And so we're told, David, in verse 7, David took the stronghold of Zion. It all seemed so easy when David was king. The thing that had been absolutely impossible for years became wonderfully real the moment of David's coronation day. He just took the city of Zion. The inhabitants were so sure of themselves that they could never be ejected that they said only the blind and the lame are necessary to defend the place. We're not told how David managed to win, though history tells us that Joab, inspired by the promise of David in verse 8 of this chapter, that whoever took the city of Jerusalem would be made his commander-in-chief, that Joab excavated underneath the wall entered from within, opened the gates of the city to David and his army. We don't know whether this is fact or not, but this much we do know that David overcame where nobody else had ever been able to overcome and occupied completely the stronghold of Zion. And in verse 10, David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. Or, as the margin puts it, a very lovely little rendering, David went, going and growing, and the Lord of hosts was with him. 
And so you see, David's authority is immediately established and confirmed. And there are all the marks and evidences of the power and presence of God with him. And you notice that even his enemies are greatly impressed. For in verse 11, Hiram, king of Tyre, brought him presents and built him a house. And it became impressed upon David's mind in the 12th verse of this chapter that the Lord had done all this for him and established him as king, not for his own sake, not that he might boast in his own authority, but for the sake of the whole land who were going to be blessed under his rule. Now, one moment. What's the Lord saying to your heart and mind about this this morning? Just this. The sovereignty of Jesus Christ in a fellow or a girl's life will be confirmed by unmistakable evidences of the presence and the power of God. And the first thing that will happen will be that an enemy who has been deeply entrenched in your soul for many a long year and whose dominion has brought you down time and time again on your face before God with a sense of humiliation and a sense of shame and a sense of awful hopelessness and awful defeat will suddenly be ejected because Jesus Christ has stepped upon the throne of your life. The dominion of the Lord Jesus is undisputed. Resist the devil, says James, and he will flee from you. Paul in Romans chapter 13 and verse 14 says, We are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Sin, Romans 6, 14, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under law, but you are under grace. And one more of the enthronement of Jesus Christ in your life will be that Satan is driven from areas of your personality which he has occupied to your discomfiture and shame for years. Has that happened to you? Oh, my beloved friend, listen to me. If your life is unholy, I don't mean by that that there may not be occasional lapses into sin, but I do mean that if the trend of your life is down, this is a thing that's only known to you and to the Lord. But if the trend of your character is unholy, then your heart is unchanged and your soul is unchanged. If God who has justified you hasn't sanctified you, and if he hasn't taught you to hate sin and love holiness, what has he done of a saving character in your heart? Nothing. And the grace which you profess to have, the grace which has made you no different, is a, totally, is a total counterfeit of the grace of the New Testament. I ask you to look into the face of the Lord Jesus and ask yourself today, is this evidence of his sovereignty being revealed in my heart? Am I still in desperate bondage? Am I still finding Satan lording it over me, kicking me around, knocking me about, and I find myself defeated and down constantly, and the trend of my life, in spite of the fact that scholastically, I'm being raised in standard morally and in terms of spiritual experience, it's downward. Then I say to you, with the authority of the word of God, if your life is unholy, your heart is unchanged and your soul is unsaved. God forgive, forbid that you and I should make a scapegoat of the grace of God that permits me to go on living on that level and yet claim to be his child. A mark of the sovereignty of Jesus Christ is the ejection of the devil. He breaks the power of cancelled sin and sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avail for me. Hallelujah. But listen, I learn also from this incident in David's life that the sovereignty of Christ is an increasing experience in my life. 
David went going and growing. Do you remember that when the angel announced the birth of our Lord to the Virgin Mary, he said to her, The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now what is true prophetically is also true experimentally in your life. It is impossible to be a Christian without submission to the sovereignty of Jesus. Romans 10, 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth who? The Lord Jesus. Romans 14, 9. To this end Christ both died and rose, that he might be Lord. I do not find any evidence in the New Testament at all to substantiate the idea that I may receive Christ as Savior and then one day when it suits me, crown him as Lord. And this is one point upon which dear old Stephen Alford and I have thorough agreement. And I talked to him about the chorus that he teaches. <laughs> and we have a little discussion. And now he says it doesn't mean that. That's all right, brother. I agree with you. I'm sure you don't mean that. Once thou hast been my saviour, now thou shalt be Lord. I don't find that in my Bible. It is absolutely impossible for a man to be born again without the citadel of self collapsing and Jesus stepping on the throne. That's regeneration. Nothing less than that. Ah, but wait a moment. That lordship is stamped and branded over an ever-increasing area of your life until one day you meet Jesus face to face. There's no end to it. May I bear personal testimony? When I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, a young fellow of 19 and 20 or so, he was Lord of my life at that time. To the limit of my capacity and to the limit of the life that he gave me, I didn't know then, at that moment, that submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and how merciful he was to hide it from me. I didn't know then that this would involve for me the end of a business career, the entry into the ministry, the leaving my home country, the travel 4,000 miles across the United States, many and a thousand and one other implications that have followed, and I am sure the end is not yet. But, all I can say to you with absolute sincerity is this, that every response in my heart to the touch and to the word and to the command of the Holy Spirit, every response of my heart in terms of faith and obedience has been accompanied by his peace and his power and immediately and immediately thereafter has been followed by a new demand made by him for his sovereignty in a new area. But I would also say that every response in my heart, and alas, there have been so many of which I'm ashamed, the response of disobedience, the response of saying no to Jesus, the response of refusal of his sovereignty on this particular issue has been followed by weeks and months of stagnation, of frustration, of defeat, and total failure. Because, you see, at any point while when I enter into the Christian experience, he is Lord at any point thereafter, I may reject his sovereignty as gently but firmly he seeks to lead me on with him. So then I learn from this portion from God's word that uh, the sovereignty of Jesus Christ is confirmed as he extends his rule and unfurls his banner over ever increasing areas of my life day by day. And furthermore, I learn from my own heart here that a life in which Jesus Christ is Lord is at least respected by other people. They may not agree with it, but it's at least respected. Sometime read the first chapter of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonian church 
And in verse 8, do you remember what he says about them? You were examples to all that believe. In every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Now, wait a moment. Let's face this very quietly and honestly in God's presence this morning. The sovereignty of Jesus Christ is confirmed. Have you the confirming evidence? Is Satan dislodged from areas of your heart in which he has been deeply entrenched for years? And is your heart saying, hallelujah, this morning, I'm free? Has that happened? Is the Holy Spirit revealing in increasing areas of your life that Jesus is Lord and every day he's making new demands of a new area? You experience it. And he's teaching you to put the label sin where you didn't have it five years ago. Gently but firmly, he's leading you on into a new realm, a new area of obedience and commitment. And he's saying to you, not that way, but this way. Don't you do that again. Do this. And slowly but surely, he is insisting upon his sovereign rights over every part of your personality. And are you finding that other people are beginning to respect you for the reality of your life? I don't mean to say they agree with your viewpoints, but at least they meet you and find they meet someone who's genuine. Not a sham, but the real thing. And furthermore, it's the Spirit of God impressing upon your heart that the Lord Jesus is doing this for you, not to make you proud of your holiness, God forbid. Not that you might go around with a halo and a heart, but that you might be a witness to him to the uttermost part of the earth. The sovereignty of Jesus Christ is being confirmed. Oh, I pray that may be true of you today. But listen, what's the next thing that happens today that this, the sovereignty of Jesus Christ is challenged? Return to my the story a moment. Look at verse 17. When the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Oh, the old devil. Here he is, the wretch. Look what he's doing. Isn't it most significant? David has been king for seven and a half years over Judah. That didn't trouble the Philistines too much. But when they saw him anointed king over all Israel, they got mighty anxious. And immediately they launched a full-scale counterattack. And they all came up to seek him and launched a full-scale attack upon the stronghold of Jerusalem. Now, I think this is a perfect analogy of what happens when Jesus is Lord. You know, Satan isn't unduly worried about um, the worldly, compromising, professed follower of Christ who uh, believes that God has given to him all things in Jesus and positionally he's secure. But he fails to exercise a living faith and a daily obedience and to possess his possessions in Christ. If that kind of person is saved at all, it's by the skin of his teeth, it's by fire, it's Romans 7 all the time. It's bondage. It's defeat. Oh, but you said that person cannot be a Christian. Wait a moment. Wait a moment. You don't become a carnal Christian when you're born again. The Corinthian church was carnal. It didn't start that way. I wonder whether any of us really are more deeply spiritual than at the moment of our new birth. Because if that new birth is genuine, I tell you, there's a broken heart. And I wonder if a man is ever more deeply spiritual at that moment. Do you ever pray as uh, Cowper prayed in that wonderful hymn of his, Where is the blessedness that once I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where's that soul-refreshing view of Jesus and his word? Oh, that moment of new birth was certainly not a moment of carnality. But as I said to you a moment or two ago, that while Jesus is Lord, there and then, at the moment of your new birth, as you go on at any moment, you may resist his sovereignty. You may reject his authority. 
And so you can never lose an eternal relationship which was established when you were born again. You can at any moment lose the sense of fellowship and you lose the sense of his presence and the reality of his nearness and you can cut off the source of all power from your life. Did I ever tell you the story about a day when I traveled in a little car in England, the sort of car I put on? You know what I mean? I see they're getting quite popular around here, though most of them come from Germany. But a uh, little car I put on, it was called a Singer. Strange name. Singer Bantam. Nine horsepower it had. Nine horses. Under the bonnet. Hood, I mean. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, I remember one day traveling in that little car, you know, up a mountainous hill in the middle of England. Up to uh, Derbyshire, Derbyshire. And as we came to the bottom of this hill, there was a, there was a great big advertising sign which said... Steepest gradient, one in three. And I wondered if I'd ever make it. And then there was a picture on this advertising sign of, of a racing car going up this very hill. You could see it reproduced in this painting. And going up this hill at about 90 miles an hour, and above it, it said, Ethel for power. Just try it. Ethel being a particular brand of uh, uh, gasoline that we use in England. So I felt very confident because 20 minutes previously I had filled up the tank of my little singer with apple. <laughs> so I put my foot on the floor and off we went at 90 miles. Oh, no, we didn't. As a matter of fact, it was pouring with rain, absolutely lashing down, like it did here the day before yesterday. Just street, just going on like that all day. And I went up this little, this steep hill in my little car, and you know, halfway up the hill, a little drop of water got in the, in the pipeline between the gas tank and the engine, and five of those horses died on the spot. <laughs> and we chugged up the top of that mountainous hill at about a mile an hour, boiling and sweating, and when I got to the top and stopped with clouds of steam coming up from the car, I thought to myself, Ethel for power. <laughs> oh, but then I thought, it wasn't Ethel's fault. She was all right. Wasn't anything wrong with it. <laughs> And, uh, perfectly all right. There was no matter of the gas was perfectly okay. The only thing that was wrong was that in the course of an uphill climb, something had got into the line that communicated power from the gas tank to the motor, and everything died out. Look, friend, that's what I mean. And at any point in my Christian life today, as I talk to you five minutes after this meeting, I am capable on any issue of my life of raising my stubborn head and saying no to Jesus. And at that point, all the power of God's Holy Spirit is held back. I haven't lost my relationship, but I've lost my fellowship. Like a child in a home who's naughty and proud or bad-tempered, and immediately, if the home is a Christian home, that child will have administered on the portion of his or her anatomy, designed from all eternity for the purpose, he will have administered to him justice. And he will go away howling, crying, yelling, not because he's been hurt, but because his pride has been injured. And he'll go to some room and haul his head off until there comes to a moment when he's prepared to repent, and then what has happened? Do you mean to tell me that child is still not my child? Of course he is. Ah, uh, but at that moment I have no fellowship, and he has no fellowship with his father. And at any moment you may resist the sovereignty of Jesus Christ and you will become a carnal Christian and will be saved as by fire. It's not how I begin my Christian life, it's how I end it that's going to count. And I say to you, therefore, that the sovereignty of Jesus Christ is challenged by a tremendous counterattack from Satan. Ah, but listen, when that sovereignty is submitted to and Jesus is king over all, then Satan launches all he can at the man who is determined to go on with God and determined at any cost to be a holy man of God continually. And if that is true of your life today, I say to you, don't be discouraged, my brother, my sister in Christ. Rejoice when you fall into divers temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, James 1, 2. And will you remember, please, or remember this almost with bated breath, that this was exactly the experience of our Lord himself. 
anointed by the Spirit on the banks of Jordan, driven, driven, mark you, by the same Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted forty days by the devil, and then returning in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, says Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. Using no other weapon to defend himself and to stand against the adversary than is available to you and to me. Refusing every suggestion that he might defeat Satan in his deity. Determined to defeat him in his humanity. Standing as man for all his brother men. And resisting every insidious attack of the enemy. Driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Filled with the Spirit. Driven by the Spirit. Returning from the battle in the power of the Spirit. For that, the capacity has become power, the experience, by the wilderness testing from the devil. It's exactly what happened to Jesus. It's exactly what will happen to you. Fullness, which might be the same, the same word for the absolute sovereignty of the Lord Jesus in your heart, fullness. Driven, driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, and that could well be going on in some heart here today, in spite of all the wonders of the fellowship of this place, oh, the wilderness of your soul. Driven by the Spirit in the wilderness, but returning in the power of the Spirit in the heaven. For the capacity of fullness has become the experience of power through mortal combat with your enemy. The serpent isn't greater than his Lord, and if Satan thinks you worth bothering about and launches a full-scale attack, it's simply because he's challenging you on the issue of the sovereignty of Jesus. But incidentally, do you notice this, the sheer arrogance of the devil? He spread himself, verse 18, he spread himself in the valley of Rephaim, typical, sprawling all over the place, mercilessly bent on attacking, where's Rephaim? Where's that? I'll tell you where it is. Just outside Jerusalem. <laughs> that subtle devil that he is. The place from which he's just been thrown out. The place which he's occupied for years. He's not going to give in to that either. Listen. Satan isn't concerned about the south side issues of your heart, of your life. Don't misunderstand me about this, but let me just say this quite frankly to you. I don't think the devil's too much concerned when the Christian stops smoking and stops swearing and stops drinking, stops going to shows and gives up all this kind of thing. I don't think the devil cares too much about him. He thinks he's reforming himself. He doesn't bother Satan too much there. When you join a fundamental evangelical, Bible-believing and blood-washed fundamentalist premillennial pre-tribulation church and sign all the creeds they ask you to sign, the devil isn't too concerned about you. It doesn't bother him. Now listen, don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating any of those things. But I say to you, listen to me, when Satan is ejected from your heart, and when the child of God begins to get desperate about his unholy thinking, about his passion and his lust and his thoughts and his desires, and he begins to use that language of Charles Wesley, which has almost gone out, alas, from our hymn of these days. Oh, that in me the sacred fire might now begin to glow. Burn up the dross of base desire, make the mountain flow. O oh, thou who at Pentecost didst fall, do thou my sins consume? Come, Holy Ghost, on thee I call, Spirit of burning. Come, burn up the draught of base desire and make the mountain flow. I tell you, Jesus said, Mark 7, 21, from within, out of the heart, proceed evil thoughts, adultery, fornication, murder, theft covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, evil eye, blasphemy, foolishness, all these come from within and defile the man. 
The devil laughs at us if we think we're separated and sanctified because we've stopped going to shows and stopped drinking and stopped gambling. Good that you've stopped them all. But let the heart cry, cry, alone with God in some lonely spot. Oh, God, oh, God, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Oh, God, cleanse me from the foulness and all that's going on in the temple which is the temple of thy Holy Spirit. Let a man get concerned about the Jerusalem, and I tell you, Satan launches a counterattack right there. He turned himself about side issues. But, brother, if you are concerned, listen to me, about going out to the mission field or going anywhere in Christian work, and you're determined to be a holy man of God continually, and nothing less is adequate, if you're concerned about that, Satan's mighty anxious about you today. The sovereignty of Christ is just. Now I've only time in two or three minutes to put to you the other side of this tremendous issue. The sovereignty of Christ, praise the Lord, is communicated. How? In the hour of the enemy's challenge, how does Jesus Christ come at the moment? The trouble with me, says somebody, is that, that while in my heart I hate myself for it afterwards, the trouble is that when the devil attacks me, he knows he's got me because I want to follow him. And my trouble is that when I'm tempted at that moment, I just want to go down, so down I go. That's my problem. And Satan's on me so fast that I've no time to do anything about him. He's won me. He's won the ally of my heart, and I've gone right along with him, gladly. And then an hour afterwards, I say, what a fool I've been. And I go to God, and I weep, and I do this and that, that and this, and I'm knocked around like a foot. You mean to tell me that's God's purpose for your life? <laughs> oh, no. How is the sovereignty of Jesus communicated? Do you notice, going back to the story, that one attack follows another, verse 18. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Verse 22, the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Isn't the devil a mean cur? At it again. Won't lie down, won't admit defeat, won't acknowledge he's beaten. He never will. And do you notice that in both of these cases, oh, now, now, if you've never listened to anything anybody said, just listen a moment. Not to me, but to the voice of the Spirit on this passage. If you were thinking of having a sleep, just wake up a second. I don't think you were, but if you were, hold everything a moment, because this is terrifically important, just before we're through. What does, um, what does David do about it? Verse 19, David inquired of the Lord. That was before the first attack. At the moment of the first attack. Verse 23, David inquired of the Lord. In other words, every time the devil hit him, immediately, David lifted his heart to God. Probably had no time to do very much, you know. We're not heard for our much speaking. Just time to say one word. Jesus, help, S-O-S. That's all. But he said it. He inquired of the Lord. And will you please notice this? It was just as well he did. For the divine strategy for victory the first time was totally different from the divine strategy in the second. In the first case, God said to him, get after him. Front full scale attack. Get after him. Chase him off. In the second case, it was sit still. And if David had copied the strategy of yesterday, in the battle of today, he had gone down. If he'd relied upon what God said to him yesterday and went out today in the strength of 24 hours uh, commissioned from heaven without a fresh understanding and a fresh uh, recognition of new strategy from heaven, he would have been in the discomfiture of defeat and have missed all that God had for him. How then is God's sovereignty communicated? Obviously, in every instance, by waiting upon the Lord. God has three answers to prayer. Did you know that? Three. Only three. Yes, no, wait. And if you would have victory through the sovereignty of Christ, and that's the only way you can have it, you must learn and I must learn never to move without seeking the counsel of the Lord. To step out into the battle without direction from heaven is to be sure to incur defeat. 
It's prayer which turns the scale. If you ask, I will do. What can pray lest you enter into temptation? Why is it, why is it that when Satan comes upon me like a flood, why is it that he finds an ally in my heart and at that moment I have no strength and I go down and I yield to him and I find I've gone with him before I know where I am? Why do I do that? Why? Because I have not steeped my heart in prayer. Because I haven't established the, the throne room, the place of the, the place of the altar, the place of waiting upon God, that this hasn't become part of my very life, and my devotional life is undisciplined, untidy, irregular, tired, weary, only a few minutes tagged on to the end of the day, and the result is I have no spiritual forces to stand against his attack. David inquired of the Lord. And brother. It's at the moment of temptation when he hits you hard. At that moment, if you've been soaking your life in disciplined prayer, there's always an answer from the Word of God ready for him in the moment of attack. It is written. It is written. Do you remember what Joseph said when he, in prison, was tempted? He said, I cannot do this thing. Well, he could have done it. Ah, but because of what he was, and because of his walk with God, and because of God's purpose for his life, I cannot do this thing. And when Satan attacks me hard, the devil, that he is, and comes at me, and I'm not prepared for him, and he puts across my line some insidious thing, I can answer and say, devil, I can't do it. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of a king. That answer from the word flashes into your soul at the moment of Satan's attack. For the Lord Jesus will never suffer you to be tempted beyond that you're able to bear, but with he will provide the way of escape. And all that is based upon the fact that you have learned in your daily walk with God to set up a disciplined prayer life in which you build up heavenly resources and equipment ready for every emergency and every attack of the devil. But may I say this very quickly to you? I learn here in this that victory in one battle does not guarantee victory in the next. Remember that? No strength is imparted to me in yesterday's victory which remains over for today. The children of Israel relied upon the manner of yesterday and kept it with bread worms and stank. And if I rely upon yesterday's outpouring and yesterday's infilling for today's battle, that's exactly what happened to me. The flesh profited nothing. It is the spirit that quickens. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Second Corinthians 4 says. And you and I always and inevitably and every day until we meet Jesus face to face will be weak and hopeless and useless and futile and absolutely inadequate and yesterday's victory does not impart one little bit of strength for today's battle. And when God communicates power through his sovereignty, he doesn't give me something apart from himself. This is what he does. He communicates his life, his own life. For Jesus said, the spirit of truth, he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will come to you. In that hour you shall know that I am in my Father, ye in me, and I in you. John 14, 16. And the Lord, listen, who knows every move of the devil, knows all his strategy, has watched him coming to attack you, indeed has permitted him to come near to you and touch you, is the Lord who is able to bring grace to match that need at that moment. One last thing, and I'm through. Sometimes he'll send you out to claim the victory with a mighty hallelujah and a mighty shout, and two of you shall chase 10,000. But at other times he'll say, sit still and wait. Wait for the sound of the going on the tops of the mulberry trees. What's that mean? Wasn't it the sound of a going that took place in an upper room at Pentecost when 120 disciples were there and there was a sound of the rushing mighty wind? And that's how God communicates his sovereignty to us, by the inflow of the power of Holy Spirit, conviction and authority into the life of the man who's waited upon him. Tell me, oh, tell me, folks, is there a sound of a going in your heart today? 
I wonder. Prayer becoming more real to you, Jesus coming nearer to you, the conviction of the Spirit gripping your heart, the awareness of his presence, the hunger for holiness, the, the desire to be all that God would have you be. These are the sounds of a going. Every thought of holiness is thine alone. And these deep longings in your soul, the deep cries unto deep in your heart, long for God's best are all the evidence of the sound of the going. Then what does the word say? Bestir yourself. Bestir yourself. Set the breeze. Set the sail to catch the breeze. Bestir yourself. Get moving. Get moving. Obey. Cast. Get out into a life of obedience and commitment. For be sure of this, that wherever there's been a crowning day in your heart, that day is accompanied by a new outpouring of the Spirit in your life. And Satan, though he never accepts defeat, is no match for the Holy Spirit. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank thee for every confirmation of thy sovereignty in our hearts. We thank thee for every challenge against it that the devil has made. But we thank thee for the communication of thy sovereign life in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may it be true that every one of us, as it was of David, that we have gone on going and growing, and the Lord of hope is with us. And now may grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be our portion, now till Jesus comes again. Amen.